and we will do this. Uh, and let's begin. Again, my name is John McNiff. I'm a ranger with the National Park Service at the Roger Williams National Memorial, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to Roger Williams Had a Wife. And our presenter tonight is Dr. Charlotte Carrington Farmer. She's an associate professor of history at Roger Williams University. She specializes in early American history with a keen interest in 17th century New England. She has published numerous papers and articles about the subject. I have known and worked with Dr. Carrington Farmer for the past nine years. It doesn't seem that long, but it would be difficult for you to find an educator with more intellectual curiosity or a more iron will determination to find a way to move forward with innovative projects. We have worked together on numerous projects to engage not just our university students, but the general public in an understanding and appreciation of everyday 17th century life in New England. Through experimental, experimental learning, we have brought first year Roger Williams University students to England so that they may visit and experience the places where Roger Williams himself was educated, where he lived, and even the church where he was married. Dr. Carrington Farmer is an extremely well-organized and de determined educator. She has partnered with Plymouth Patuxet in a wide range of projects, including bringing students to stay overnight in the museum, running staff training sessions, offering lunch and learning lectures, and being part of Along the Shore of Change. Building on her interest in Roger Williams, she's currently working on a journal article on Mary Williams, tentatively titled, Roger Williams Had a Wife, writing Mary Williams, nay Barnard, back into the historical record. And that, in part, is what we're going to hear tonight. I give you all Dr. Charlotte Carrington Farmer. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks for the applause, Stan, too. Um, it's so nice to see so many people here and such a lovely introduction from John, who really is one of the people who knows the most about Roger Williams. So it's always um, a huge uh, privilege for me to work with him. Uh, and as John said, then, this is um, a journal article that I would say I've been working on perhaps for the past year. Um, I've been thinking about Roger Williams. Um, I calculated for, for 20 years, right? Like he first came on my radar when I was an undergraduate student working with Professor John Coffey in England. And I, I ended up writing my undergraduate senior thesis on Roger Williams some 20 odd years ago uh, and it took me like 19 years later to finally think about Mary but I am so happy to share what is really a work in progress with you as I start to kind of flesh out what I hope will be a reasonable journal article with you so bear with me one second I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen with you all right so as you can see on the screen then um Oops, sorry. Uh, Roger Williams did indeed have a wife and I didn't know what punctuation to start with. I was like dot, 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 question mark, exclamation mark, because I think all of those uh, pieces of punctuation get across the fact that Mary has, uh, even with me, uh, been really ignored. And so the kind of subtitle to this talk tonight is writing Mary Barnard, Mary Williams back into the historical record. So as the title of the lecture suggests, uh, Roger Williams did indeed have a wife. And like so many other 17th century women, it's really hard to recover the details of her life. We think there's one surviving copy of her handwriting from June 1650. And although it's partially cancelled out in a different ink, we can see Mary's address to her husband, Roger, when she writes, and I quote, my dear and loving hun husband. Um, and in a twist of fate, or perhaps irony is better, Roger Williams' thoughts on the death penalty for adultery are written alongside the surviving folio. And I wish that could be my opening slide, but alas, due to COVID, I've not been able to get into Massachusetts Historical Society where it's housed. So I'm just going to leave that opening thought with you. And hopefully, um, once we all get the vaccination this summer, I'll be able to share that manuscript source with you. But aside from those five written words, it seems that we don't really have any other surviving documents that Mary wrote in order to learn about her life. 
thus we need to be really creative with the sources we use in order to try to flesh out her life story. And one way we'll try to do this this evening is using documents that other people wrote about her, wrote to her, and that were written in connection to her life. And we'll use these documents and sources as a way to try to think about the life she lived in both the 17th century in England before she migrates and what her life was like when she crosses the pond and moves to New England. Okay, um, let's go back to the beginning then and start our story here at Oates, um, the Masham Manor in the parish of High Laver in the County of Essex in 1629. As you can see, the image on the screen is from much later in the, in the 19th century, as the manor is sadly no longer standing. So at Oates then, um, this was the manor of Sir William Masham, who was a county magistrate who was married to Elizabeth Masham. And we're down here in Essex. Um, this is geographically where we are, um, down in High Laver in Essex. So Oates then was married to Elizabeth Masham. And Mary Barnard, who eventually became Mary Williams, worked as a maid in the household you see on the screen. Enter Roger Williams in 1629, who was appointed recently as a chaplain at the Masham Manor after his recent graduation from Cambridge University. Straight out of college, I guess unsurprisingly maybe, Roger fell rapidly head over heels in love. And luckily for us, his earliest surviving letters reveal his passion for his new love which he described as a rolling snowball or some flowing stream, which extends and gathers stronger and stronger. And he knew he was, and I quote again, altogether unworthy and unmeet for such a proposition. His love was, and I quote again, all the honey of my life. And he sought marriage joys. I mean, he had it bad. Um, to put it bluntly, he said, for the present, I know none in the world I more affect such love, but not for his eventual wife, Mary Barnard. In the letters that survived to Lady Joan Barrington, Roger was declaring his undying love and asking for mission, permission to marry someone else, Jane Whaley. Whaley was the niece of Lady Joan Barrington, who was the mother of Elizabeth Masham of Oates Manor. However, Lady Barrington forbade the marriage on the grounds that Williams was not of a suitable, suitable social status. And William was, was really devastated. He lamented, and I quote, we hope to live together in the heavens, although the Lord has denied that union on earth. Williams wrote the letters declaring his undying love for Jane Whaley in April and May, 1629. And just seven months later, he married Mary Barnard. We don't know if Mary ever saw these letters, but she must have been well aware of his love and intention to marry someone else. In fact, in the letter asking for Jane Whaley's hand in marriage, Roger might have meant Mary Barnard when he said, and I quote, poor yet as I am, I have some few offers at present, one put into my hand, person and present portion worthy, yet stand they still at door and still shall, until the fairest end of the Lord shall please to give this, shall come to light. So what's he saying then? Was Mary Barnard the offer he'd already had, but he left her waiting until he was rejected by Jane Whaley via her aunt? You know, it could well mean that Roger was aware of Mary's love, but left her hanging as he pursued Jane Whaley's hand in marriage. After Lady Joan Barrington refused Roger's proposal, he got, and I quote, sick of a burning fever, and he sunk into depression. It was Mary who nursed him through this. Mary, in many ways, was a suitable match for Roger in terms of jointure and dowry. Mary was the, maid of jo uh, the maid of Joanna Anthem, Lady Masham's daughter by her first marriage. And this is some really complicated genealogy, so bear with me. The letter from Lady Masham to her mother, which is housed in England amongst the Egerton manuscripts at the British Library reads, I quote, Mr. Williams is to marry Mary Barnard, Doug Altham's maid. Mary's position then as a maid was no real mark of humble origin or even low social standing. It meant that she was perhaps more of a companion rather than a servant, which was quite a common position for daughters of the upper gentry or the clergy of which Mary was. It gave her social connections and training in manners, household arts and management, 
all of which were absolutely no use at all to Mary in the eventual life she would go on to lead here in Rhode Island and more of her Rhode Island later. Um, so let's focus on Mary's family background then. So as we say, our story starts here. So Roger and Mary meet down here in Essex uh, in High Laver. And you can see then this is um, the church, All Saints High Laver, where Roger and um, Mary um, get married. Um, here's Essex um, in, as a later map um, in 1695, but pretty much as, as Mary would have known it. You can see here then um, that we're down here, High Laver is here, um, and we're going to kind of flip back up north in a second. So geographically, that's where our story with Roger starts. So let's focus on Mary's early background, like what can we tell of her story before she meets Roger? Well, we can be reasonably sure that Mary was the daughter of Reverend Richard Barnard or, or Bernard. We see it spelt with an A and uh, an E. There's no standardization of spelling in the 17th century. So Richard Barnard then worked at Worksop in Nottinghamshire when his daughter Mary was born in 1609. So we come from, we were just down here geographically where Roger and Mary meet south of Cambridge in, in Essex. Mary is born in, in the Midlands in, in, um, in Worksop in Nottinghamshire. Um, and again, I'll show you some, some later 17th century maps. So Worksop is, is here, um, kind of up to the top left-hand side. And you can see here, Worksop's here. And the Worksop Manor is still standing today. If you ever get the chance, you should um, definitely go and see it. So this is where Mary is from. She's, uh, she's from the Midlands, just like I am. So Mary then was the third child and she had five brothers. There's a record of a christening of Mary Barnard in Worksop for the 24th of September, 1609. And the family lived in Worksop until Richard Bernard took up the position at Backcombe in Somerset. So moving further, further south again. Mary's dad then was an important Puritan clergyman. After attending Christ College, Cambridge, he embraced Puritanism and even flirted with separatism. He comes close and kind of loses his job for a bit over his descent with the established church in Worksop in Nottinghamshire uh, before Mary's born in 1605. And he was brought to the church courts multiple times in 1608 and again in 1611 for his for refusal to conform to the Church of England. So let's think about this. Mary's dad, right, like a Puritan who flirts with separatism, who's willing to give up a job gets in trouble with the authorities, moves for his religion. I mean, it sounds a bit like Mary's eventual husband, Roger Williams. So let's go back then to William's first love, Jane Whaley, because it turns out there's more to the story than Williams not being enough of enough high status to marry um, Jane Whaley. So Jane Whaley then was the daughter of Richard Whaley of Nottinghamshire. So this geographic Nottinghamshire connection kicks in a bit more and Francis Cromwell, Lady Joan Barrington's sister. So I think there's this geographic connection with Nottinghamshire. And after her mother's death, then Jane, again, Roger's first love, who, who he doesn't marry, moved to live with the Barringtons at Broad Oak in Essex, which is, you know, just a few miles away from, from High Laver. And she came under the care of uh, Lady Joan. So when Mary's dad, Richard Bernard or Barnard, got the job here in Worksop, it's really interesting that the reason why he got it was because of the patronage of Richard Whaley, right? So think back to Roger's first love, it's Jane's dad who gets Mary's dad this job at works of. So put bluntly then, what does this mean? Roger Williams was not a suitable match to marry Richard Whaley's daughter, but he was good enough to marry the daughter of one of Richard Whaley's employees. Um, so the record then um, of the marriage of, of Roger and Mary is held at the Essex County Archives in Chelmsford and it reads Roger Williams Clerk and Mary Barnard were married at the 15th day of December 1629 and, and Clark just means that, that he or Clark or Clerk depending which side of the Atlantic you're on um, just means that he was uh, an educated literate man at this point. Um, so we can see here then that this is where they were married. So this is All Saints Church High Labour. Um, this is, as, as Range McNiss said, um, a, a place that both he and I have been fortunate to go back to twice and take um, some of our students as to retrace Roger. You can see that inside, I mean, the exterior really hasn't changed 
at all, I don't think, since Roger and Mary were married there in um, 1629. The inside for a Church of England church is super plain. Uh, and both McNiff and I have talked about this, like, you know, has that changed since the 17th century? You know, Roger probably wouldn't have wanted to get married in a church, um, you know, but would it would have it eased his kind of Puritan soul that it was plain? So there's lots to unpick about the, the church itself. Um, here's Ranger McNiff in action talking to my students. Uh, here's my students outside. Uh, at um, All Saints High Labour. Uh, and here's a fabulous group picture that, that I took. Uh, the, the place I stood next to is, um, is John Locke's grave. And so um, that's really exciting to think about the fact that Locke is buried in the place where, where Roger got married. And we're in the midst of thinking about the next time we go back and do this trip, which hopefully will be spring break next year, uh, going to visit some of the sites that are connected to Mary. And then also thinking about installing a plaque in this church to Roger and the, the idea that was floated by um, their, their fabulous church warden who you see here um, is, is to have it kind of on the inside of the church backing onto Locke's tomb thinking about the, the contributions that both of them made so that's in the work you, you heard it here first. Um, all right so Growing up in Worksop meant that Mary and her family knew several really important people who would go on eventually to found Plymouth Colony. Um, so what you see on the map there then, here's Worksop down here. And then again, just a few miles, like I've made this drive between Worksop and Scrooby and Osterfield a few times and it's, it's really not far. Um, so Mary grew up in the hub of all the places, basically Osterfield, Scrooby, you can see some of the signs here. Um, that there are in, in these places connected to the pilgrims who, who go down to Plymouth. Um, and so Mary's dad certainly knew William Brewster and John Robinson. And I wonder if you're now like thinking, like I thought this talk was about Mary Williams. Like why on earth is she talking about these two random guys, right? John Robinson and William Brewsters who I may or may not have heard of. Like maybe you're thinking like, this is a Rhode Island Women's History Event Month. Why is she going on about English history and Plymouth Colony? Well, I think it's worth laboring this point because it connects directly to Mary Williams' life. William Brewster was the Pilgrims' religious leader in Plymouth and John Robinson was the pastor to the Pilgrims whilst they were in, in Leiden in Holland. Robinson then, and this blew my mind, Robinson was involved in pamphlet wars and I always explain pamphlet wars to my students as like 17th century Twitter wars, right? Where people like publish a pamphlet and then all of a sudden a few months later, someone else publishes a pamphlet and they go back and forward just like people do with, with tweets today. So Robinson was involved in pamphlet wars with Mary's dad. Um, and William Brewster then was a, was a firm friend of Robinson. And with William Brewster having known Sir Francis Bacon and with Roger Williams having been mentored by Sir Edward Cook, who had a lot of beef with each other, like what frictions might have been between these two men and then by default with Mary. So when Mary went to Plymouth Colony with Roger in 1631, you know, everyone must have known who her dad was and everyone must have known who Mary was. They must have known her when she was growing up in Worksop. And what's even more interesting is that Mary's dad corresponded with ministers in New England, most notably Massachusetts minister John Cotton, and they debate all kinds of stuff like personal issues, uh, theological issues, pastoral issues. Um, and whilst we don't have the, all the letters, they were probably part of a much more robust correspondence that sadly hasn't survived. So in 1637, Mary's dad, Richard, sent two manuscript treaties to John Cotton and leaders in New England in an attempt to kind of semi-privately correct certain ecclesiastical pra practices that they were loggerheads about. So after flirting with separatism, Mary's dad, Richard, then does this U-turn and continues to insist that the Church of England was a true church. And he did so even in a letter that survives in 1637 to John Cotton in New England. Like, what does all this information mean? Well, it means that Rogers, uh, Mary's dad was corresponding with John Cotton, like right before John Cotton and Roger Williams get into their epic pamphlet wars that play out in the 1640s. So we also know then Mary lived in the separate colony, a separatist colony of Plymouth with leaders that knew her family from Nottinghamshire when her dad was publishing pamphlets, basically saying that separatism was wrong. I mean, that must have been uncomfortable. 
Um, what's more then, Roger Williams must have known his father-in-law as Richard Bernard didn't die until 1641, 1642. I mean, these are questions I'm asking because I don't know the answer. Did Roger correspond with his father-in-law and the letters haven't survived? Or are they hidden away in some archive, perhaps in Nottinghamshire or perhaps in, in, uh, in Somerset later on? Uh, and we just don't know. Or did the men not correspond? Like, why? I mean, the plot really does thicken. So as I said to you, this is a work in progress. So um, hopefully you have some ideas about this. And we can get a glimpse into Mary's childhood from her father's writing, as Richard Barnard published extensively on a really wide range of things. Um, so I've just pulled a few of them up. There are really too man many to mention um, tonight. So uh, you can see here then, this is uh, Barnard um, basically um, uh, publishing stuff um, in, in 1607. You can see here, this is one of his uh, more famous works, The Faithful Shepherd. Um, and again, look who he's, he's writing this for, deeply religious work, which might be very profitable for both like young students who intend to study theology, right? Well, I mean, is this something Roger would have read? I mean, I, I asked this because I don't know, I'm posing the question. Um, he publishes, um, here we are, um, Christian advertisements and councils of peace. And look at this, also dissuasions from the separatists, right? And so he's basically, this is one of the pamphlets that he kind of goes after uh, the, the separatists with. And again, here we see more here, uh, his plain evidence, these this directed against the separatists again. Um, and so again, thinking about like Mary's eventual life when she's in Plymouth, you know, everyone would have known about what her dad thought about separatism. Um, one of the cool things I get to do on campus is I get to teach a class on uh, witchcraft in the early modern Atlantic world. And we do um, a case study of witchcraft in 17th century England. And one of the books we read is the book that Mary's dad writes as a guide to grand juryman. Um, and the second book is here, look, a treatise touching on, um, on witches, right? So, Mary's dad writes at length about famous um, 16th and 17th century witchcraft cases in England. Um, so it's, it's, it's really, really interesting to me that um, Mary's dad writes at length and is a really interesting primary source on witchcraft. Um, I think Mary's dad's most famous book is, is this one. And we actually get a really nice uh, image of Richard Bernard here, um, The Isle of Man. And what's really interesting about this book, it's published much later than some of the other ones I've just been showing you in 1629. So think about what also happens in 1629. That's when Roger and Mary get married. Um, and we can see here then he has, um, one of the things we can do to try to get our head around like what was Mary's childhood like is to think about the stuff her, um, her dad publishes um, about like instructing children, right? So this is a really cool source that gives us an insight. So basically, um, let me just have a drink of tea. He's talking in this section basically about, uh, you see the subheading here on household government. Um, and he talks about like, you know, what, you know, why is it important to read the scriptures? You know, like what, what's the importance of this? And I'm gonna try and make a point a bit later about Mary being literate. So I want to keep this in mind as we talk about this. Um, and I want to just highlight a couple of things then. Again, this is in his section on household government. So basically he's like, you know, in a household government, they must keep all from like idleness, right? Um, the nurse or rather mother of all wickedness uh, as of pride in apparel, like wasteful experiences, vain pastimes uh, and other sins of the flesh uh, to be abhorred by Christians. So we can imagine that she grew up in a deeply religious uh, household with her dad publishing this story. Stuff. And he writes then about the role of the husband in the household, right? So again, Mary's dad writes, you know, where the husband is loving, the wife learns obedience. And where the wife is obedient, the husband, you know, is moved to be kind. Um, and again, he's got this interesting piece here about like, you know, why ought children to be religious? And he's got like pages on this and he lists bunches of reasons. So again, we can, we don't have Mary saying, I grew up in a really religious place. But again, using these sources, we can be creative and read between the lines what it would have been like for Mary growing up with, with Richard Barnard as a dad. I feel like I could give a whole lecture on Roger Williams had a father-in-law, his name was Richard Barnard, but alas, that's not the focus of our talk tonight. So let's 
return to Mary. Following her marriage, Mary and Roger decided that England's religious climate was just too dangerous, and Roger had job prospects across the Atlantic in New England. Mary arrived in Boston in February 1631 on the Lion. As is well known, when they arrived, Roger was offered the position of teacher of the Boston church, but turned it down. What must Mary have thought? Did he discuss it with her? Did he listen to her opinions? She just got married, crossed the Atlantic, and now her husband had turned down perhaps the most important job within the new community they just crossed an ocean to join. Did it remind you of her dad? I mean, as you can see on the map then, um, Roger and Mary moved around a lot. What was it like to be constantly on the move? What was it like for Mary to be married to someone who was increasingly known as time went on in the early 1630s as someone who was an outspoken dissenter? And the move again then to Plymouth and then back to Salem. And I feel like it's fair to say with all this chewing and froing, it would have been quite hard for Mary to kind of settle down and build roots and build connections with other women in the colonies. In October 1635, Massachusetts Bay banished Roger from the colony for his new and dangerous opinions. Initially, as we all know, the implementation was deferred until the spring as Williams was ill and winter was rapidly approaching. I mean, we joked about the weather, right? It's raining here tonight. But one of the things that Park Ranger and I, McNiff and I often talk about is that how, you know, in England, when we get an inch of snow, the world ends and we don't know what to do. Um, and obviously in New England, we get you know, quite often several feet of snow. So, you know, it's really interesting to think about what that winter would have been like for Williams, who in McNiff's words, not my own, was was a city boy from London, right? It's not even as though he's from the countryside. He he grew up in London, he spends time in Cambridge and then high labor. So this winter thing is is really interesting. Anyway, so Roger got ill, the winter was approaching. And I guess if he's ill, it means Mary would have spent her time nursing him. Like, what did she think then when her husband continued to meet with other like-minded individuals in, in their home to share his ideas? Like, how did she feel when the magistrates ruled to seize him immediately and send him back across the pond to England? I mean, I'm sure she must have been terrified. As we know, Roger got a tip off about the arrest and he escaped in the midst of this blizzard in January 1636. And it's worthy of pausing on Roger's own words as he reflected on this later. He said that ever honored governor, Mr. Winthrop privately wrote to me to steer my course to Narragansett Bay and the Indians. Williams took, and I quote, Williams prudent motion as a hint and voice from God. And I steered my course from Salem. Roger reflected, you know, many years later that he still remembered the cold and the snow, which I feel yet. 14 weeks in bitter winter season, did he not know what bed or bread did mean? And writing 35 years after his banishment, Roger still believed he'd been, and I quote, unkindly and unchristianly, I believe, driven from my house and land and wife and children in the midst of a New England winter. What was this like for Mary then, right? Left in Salem whilst her husband fled, trying to tend for her growing family. Did she have anyone to confide in? Was she worried about giving away her husband's location? Did she even know where he was? Did she worry she might never see him again? And, you know, think about Mary's growing family at the time. As you see on the PowerPoint then, Mary had six children who survived into adulthood. Um, there's a very active Roger Williams Family Association who work really hard on the genealogy and family associations. And as I zoomed in, I saw their president, Dawn Williams, is on the Zoom. So I really do check out the great work um, that they do. Um, so when Roger was banished from Massachusetts in 1635, um, John Winthrop noted that one of Roger's new and dangerous opinions was, and I quote, that he ought not tender an oath to an unregenerate man, that a man ought not to pray with such, though wife, child, etc. So I gave a similar talk on, on Mary Williams pretty much around this time last year, actually, at Plymouth Patuxet, uh, formerly Plymouth Plantation, and they did a great dramatic piece 
to kind of accompany my, my academic talk, which was entitled The Loneliness of Soul Liberty, which explored what it might have been like for Mary if Roger did refuse to pray with her at home. And I was talking to Park Ranger Mac McNiff about this about a year ago now. Um, and, you know, we know that there was this dispute at one point early on in Providence when Roger did refuse to break bread with an unredeemed soul. So what does this mean? Well, maybe Mary hadn't had the conversion experience. It never seems to come up again. And, and then McNiff made this really amazing point to me. He says the re reality of living in like a 15 by 20 house with her making the meals makes makes he and I wonder, I think, how long it actually lasted. So once Mary and Roger settled in Providence, Mary spent a lot of time caring for her family and those that ended up at her house. And it always seems to me like reading Roger's correspondence that there are so many people who are constantly coming to their house. I feel like she never really got much of a break. We know then that in the midst of the war with the Pequots in 1637, Mary nursed and saved a soldier's life, Thomas Roberts, when he was left almost dying at her house. Roger wrote about it, he noted, and I quote, through the Lord's mercy, my wife has got Thomas Roberts upon his legs, though very weak. In September, 1649, Mary sent her loving respects to John Winthrop Jr. And in the same year, Mary took her teenage daughter, also named Mary, to see Dr. John Clark in Newbury in Massachusetts. Mary Jr. suffered with a flux of the room that had much affected her head and right eye, and she'd taken much physic and been let blood. So we know then that Mary spent time caring for her children and ferrying them to various doctor's appointments. Mary tended to those in the community. When Roger wrote to John Winthrop Jr. in November 1649, he asked, and I quote, My wife, pray a little of your powder for Mrs. Weeks' daughter of Warwick who is every winter greatly afflicted by occasion. One of the most interesting sources that we have linked to Mary is what you see on the screen, Experiments of Spiritual Health and Life, which Roger published when he was in London on charter business, again, in 1652. Roger wrote then, and I'm quoting from the, uh, the excerpt that you see on the screen, um, he wrote then, the plain and peaceable discourse of my own personal experiments in a letter to my dear wife upon occasion of her great sickness near death. So Mary nearly dies then. Um, he addressed it, and I quote, to my dearest love and companion, and I'm going to read some excerpt to you. He says, I hope and earnestly desire to live the rest of our short and uncertain span, not as strangers longing and breathing after another. We must cast off our great cares and fears of this life that is, so, is, that is so soon blown out. My dear love, since it pleased the Lord so to dispose of me and my affairs at present, that I cannot often see thee, I now send thee, which I know will be sweeter to thee than the honey and the honeycomb, the stronger refreshment than the strongest wines, and of more value than if every line and letter were thousands of gold and silver. I send thee, though in winter, a handful of flowers made upon in a little posy, for thy dear self and our dear children to look and smell on, when as the grass of the field shall be gone and withered. And I hope that brings, um, I hope that brings comfort to people who might be missing people. And I hope it gives you a sense that hopefully Roger and Mary had at least some happy moments in their marriage. And he seems to have really had, he really seemed to care about her at this moment. So as the pamphlet suggests then, one of the things that defined Mary's life was absence from her husband. Once they settled in Providence, Roger spent a lot of time at his trading post at Cumsit and away tending to what he described as Indian affairs. Roger had a young Indian boy who Roger ambiguously described as a servant living with him. And we know that various important indigenous leaders stopped regularly by the house. So it's not too far fetched to assume that Mary would have had at least some basic proficiency in Narragansett. And I know that Dr. Julie Fisher, author of um, Ninigret Sachem of the Niantic and Narragansett, is doing some interesting work on this. So stay tuned for more of that. One way or the other then, Roger's absence, so Mary's husband's absence, has meant that Mary was left running the household. Her husband went back to England twice, right? Once in the 1640s and again in the 1650s to work on Rhode Island's charter. We get a sense of her life back in Providence from a letter that Roger sent back from London to Gregory Dexter. 
Um, and I've got some images to show you. I thought I'd show you some of the, the lines. So the section that I'm going to read to you is where this blue hour is. It says duty and affection. I've zoomed in. So this is a bit uh, I'm going to I'm going to read to you. He says my duty. So he's writing to Gregory Dexter about what's going on in England. He says my duty and affection have compelled me to acquaint my poor companion with it. I consider, so poor companion, I think he's talking about Mary. I consider our many children, the dangers of the seas and enemies. And in, in an earlier letter, he'd mentioned war with the Dutch and French. And therefore I write, not positively for her, only I acquaint her with our affairs. I tell her how joyful I shall be of her being here with me until our affairs were ended. I freely leave her to wait upon the Lord for direction and according as she finds her spirit free and cheerful, so to come or stay. So if it please the Lord to give her a free spirit to cast herself upon the Lord, I doubt not your love and faithful care in anything she have occasion to use your help concerning our children and our affairs during our absence. So think about that, right? Like he's saying like, it's up to her. Right. She has her own free spirit. Right. Like he, her spirit is free. We'll leave it up to her and the Lord to decide if she should come. Um, and we know then that he worried about his wife and his children whilst he was over in England. So Roger was still in England on the 1st of April, 1653, when he wrote, excuse me, a letter to the town of Providence and Warwick to update them. I've transcribed this letter for you. I'm not going to make you strain at the screen anymore. Um, so from this letter, it appears that he was even more keen uh, for Mary or the Lord to decide if it was right for her to join him, which she never did. He wrote, and I quote, remember, I am a father and husband. I've longed earnestly to return with the last ship. If you conceive it necessary for me to still to attend this service, pray you consider if it not be convenient that my poor wife be encouraged to come over to me and to wait together on the good pleasure of the Lord for the end of the matter, i.e. the charter business. I write to my dear wife, my great desire of her coming while I stay, yet left it to the freedom of her spirit because of the many dangers truly at present, the seas are dangerous. My dear friends, although it pleased God himself to encourage me, yet please you to remember that no man can stay here as I do without much self-denial. I mean, it's really clear that Roger missed his wife and he was desperate for her to join him in England. But in her freedom of spirit, she chose to stay put in Providence. How was it for Mary then running a home in Providence and raising six children when her husband was constantly away on business, whether it was Indian affairs or whether it was running his trading post or indeed leaving her twice in Providence while he sailed to England on charter business? We know that in addition to her own children, Mary actually had at least one other family member in New England. Mary's eldest brother, Maziko Oclothia, under the patronage of the Whaley family again, and I think there's more on this coming later, emigrated from Weymouth, Dorset, with his wife, again confusingly called Mary, and two children in 1636. The group with whom he travelled under the leadership of Minister Joseph Hull settled in Weymouth, Massachusetts. William Harris of Providence mentioned having business, and I quote, with Mr Barnard, the brother of Mr Williams, his wife in a letter from the 14th of November, 1666. On a day-to-day -day basis then, what was Mary li Mary's life like? What did Mary make of the lively experiment in religious freedom that she found herself living in? What did she think of the Quakers, Samuel Gorton and Hutchinson when they all moved into the area? How did she feel when long-term friends and family turned on her and wished her husband dead and burned his books because of his controversial ideas. And the more I think about Roger, the more questions I have about Mary's experience, which perhaps we might never be able to answer. The end of Mary's life was bleak. At the age of 67 in the midst of King Philip's war, Mary was once again separated from Roger as he stayed in Providence while she took refuge on a Quidnick Island. In a list of men who quote, stayed and went not away, Roger is listed first. We know Mary was alive and well on the 1st of April, 1676, as Roger wrote to his brother Robert, quote, by my wife, I wrote to you some particulars of the goings of God. 
Mary's house was burnt to the ground in the midst of the fighting, and the Providence Town records for the months immediately after the burning describe the rebuilding. We know that town meetings were held by the tree by the waterside as the houses were rebuilt. Women and children, including Mary, returned from the island towns. A record from the 30th of August, 1676 reads, and I quote, by God's providence, it's seasonably come to pass that Providence Williams, the, the son, right, not the town, Providence Williams, the son, Mary's son, bought up his mother from Newport in his sloop and cleared the town by his vessel of all the Indians to the great peace and content of all the inhabitants. Again, this is worthy of pause. Mary's husband, Roger, was the first to sign the document which you see on the screen, um, enslaving Indigenous peoples. Then her son, Providence, cleared the town by his vessel of all the Indians. And it's the very same sloop that Mary sailed on as she returned home to her hometown of Providence. And this is the last icon. So thinking about the last item concerning Mary, um, this is it. It's likely that Mary spent her last days with either her son, Joseph, or Daniel. There's a letter which was written a while after in which Daniel Williams says, I quote, I do not desire to say what I have done for both father and mother. I judge they wanted nothing that was convenient for ancient people. And I just love that he's calling his mom and dad ancient people. Um, we know that Roger lamented that he ended up near destitute, not having any paper to record his public business on. So to be honest then, the exact cause and date of Mary's death is a bit of a mystery. We can estimate that perhaps it was in, you know, in 1676, maybe. We know that Roger died in 1683, um, approximately aged 80, and he's been buried, we think, three times. Originally, Roger was buried right behind his house, right opposite what is now Roger Williams National Memorial. Um, and I was picking, again, Park Ranger McNiff's brains about this when I first started to think about this as a, as a project. Um, and so he and I talked about this and he was telling me, um, you know, that we know that archaeologists, when they dug up Roger's first grave in the 1860s, they found a woman buried next to him. It was a separate grave, but it's close to him. And in the grave, we think there was a piece of braided hair along with teeth and coffin nails and bone fragments, which led people to believe that it was probably Mary. You know, side by side graves right next to the home lot, around the right age, right place on the hill, next to the foundation of the family house. So we think it's her. Um, when they move Roger, they we think, you know, they move Mary too. So she, like Roger, has had multiple resting places. So hopefully what you see on the slide is her final resting spot today, overlooking the city she eventually came to call home. So to conclude then, I'm going to talk for just a, a couple, like maybe three or four minutes and make some concluding statements about women's history and then we'll take some questions. To conclude then, it's clear from trying to piece together Mary Williams' life that doing women's history is hard. You have to be creative with the sources that you use to shed life on light on their experiences. But it is important to tell their stories. As we've seen from Mary's example, how much we know about women in the early modern period so often depends upon the men in their lives. Mary Williams was a white, white woman who married a famous, maybe infamous is a better word, uh, man. After lamenting how hard it is to tell her story, it's worthy of pause to consider her comparatively. And when I talked about Mary at Plymouth Patuxet, formerly Plymouth Plantation, again this time last year, historian Lisa Wilson really made a wise remark that's resonated with me that, you know, white, writing the history of white women in New England is so much easier than doing it for their white counterparts as she is in the British Caribbean colonies. It's even harder to tell the stories of indigenous women. One woman I often wonder about is like, who is Margaret who potentially saved Roger's life, right? You see the sign here that the Roger Williams Family Association installed a couple of years ago. So, you know, when Roger's fleeing, Margaret is the one who provides um, shelter. So who is Margaret? How much could we find out about her? Um, you know, one piece of, one other thing to think about is telling the stories of enslaved women is even harder. You know, one piece of work that I can't wait to read in the future is the work of Jared Passett, who's a PhD candidate at Rutgers, who's currently writing his dissertation on enslaved and freed African-American women's lives and labors in New England. So watch this space. 
It's also worth thinking about how Mary Williams fits within historiographical trends, particularly women's history, gender history, and Atlantic history. Um, I'm also waiting with bated breath for Lisa Wilson's forthcoming study comparing, comparing the experience of 17th century women in Barbados, Bermuda, Virginia, and New England. So we, we can't think about Mary in isolation is what I'm trying to say to you. Um, other scholars, if you're interested in some cool pieces of women's history, are Sarah Pearsall, who's based at the University of Cambridge. She's written several wonderful pieces looking at early modern women. And my personal favorite is recentering Indian women in the American Revolution. There are so many great examples of women's history out there. So forgive me if I miss any of my recommendations. And I'm also realizing as I'm making these suggestions, and I imagine maybe you're like frantically trying to get pen and paper to scribble them down. I'm more than happy to kind of send them in the chat later or to have you email me and I'll send you uh, what I'm talking about. Um, anyway, so a few suggestions for you. Um, a really interesting set of uh, essays that I sometimes set for my students, you see on the screen, um, is Women in Early America. Uh, and as you can see on the table of contents, there's some really interesting essays within her here, uh, looking at um, all, like all of the colonies, all of the different uh, perspectives. So I encourage you to check out that edited collection. And the historian who edited this, um, Foster, has published extensively on sexuality and gender in early America. And one of my favorite articles, which um, you see the title of on the screen here is um, Deficient Husbands, Manhood, Sexual Incapacity and Male Marital Status in 17th Century New England, in which he uses court records to examine how women brought their husbands to court and divorce them if they were unable to sexually fulfill them. So I encourage you to check that out. And any time uh, when I'm teaching the experience of early modern women, I always try to share interesting primary sources with my students, including things like uh, the School of Venus from 1680. Um, a few uh, of the secondary sources not specifically connected to New England that I want to share with you um, are by, again, one of my favorite scholars, Mary Beth Norton. Um, you can see um, here, uh, founding mothers and founding fathers and then separated by, um, by, uh, by their sex. Um, another recommendation coming back to New England is Elaine Bres Breslau books, Breslau's book, uh, which you see on the screen, which offers an interesting take on the multicultural elements of the indigenous Arawak enslaved woman, Tituba, who was accused of witchcraft in Salem Village in 1692. I really love this book. I, I recommend it. Um, I think other scholars to think about um, are Betty Wood. She was my PhD advisor in grad school. Um, and I suggest that you check out all of her work. Um, but particularly, I, I recommend this book, which is a case study of two women using their correspondence. Uh, Mary Telfair to Mary um, Hugh. I'm mindful of time, so let's wrap things up with one final point. When historian Laurel Thatcher Ulrich published what I guess she thought was a rather obscure article in 1976 on Puritan funerals, she didn't realize that one sentence that she wrote would go on to appear on t-shirts, mugs, bumper stickers, greeting cards, and all sorts of websites and blogs. Uh, she said then, um, oh, here's a couple of other recommendations. I'll come back to these in a second. Um, she said then, um, well-behaved women seldom make history. And like any good historian, Ulrich used this as a teachable moment and turned it into a book project, which you see on the, the left hand side of the screen. Um, which examines women who challenge the way history was written and reimagines female possibilities by looking at women who didn't try to make history, but did. Um, Ulrich has published extensively on women's history and another personal favorite is what you see on the right hand side of the screen, A Midwife's Tale. Given the historical moment that we're living in, um, we as historians, I think, need to do more, right? I think we need to move beyond what the historiography has termed great man history, and we need to think more about bottom-up history. You know, every March, debates continue to swirl about whether we should have Women's History Month, right, which this event is in celebration of. Um, should we do that, or should we just do better work to tell women's history being central to all of the history that we write? You know, the same debate goes with Black History Month as well. Um, and moreover, I think as we continue to examine the people that we revere with statues and holiday, I'm particularly well aware that my talk tonight was, be, was about a privileged in many ways white woman's experience of the 17th century. So as Mary Williams' life shows then, 
We need to do our best to rise above the challenges of step, telling those stories of women's history that haven't been told. Roger Williams did have a wife and we have so much more to learn about her. Thank you so much and I'll pause there and All right, bear with me one second. All right, um, McNiff, I don't know if you want to kind of um, handle the questions that you pose. Absolutely. Um, if you do have questions, put them in the chat and I will hand them off to Charlotte. Um, I, first of all, I, I really, Charlotte, that was absolutely beautiful. I even learned some amazing things in, in, in this lecture. So um, that's possible, McNiff. like there's no way that's, that's, yes. a, that, that's not true. I, I keep telling you, I do not know everything. Well, we'll have a private argument about this next time when we're retracing Roger and Mary. Ac absolutely. Um, so the first question I have here, um, where are they coming in fast and quick? Da, 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 da. Do you know where the Williams home was located in Providence and where was Roger's trading post? I mean, you could answer these questions probably better than me. So the, the house is is opposite where Roger Williams National Memorial stands today, right? Like if the memorial, as you go down, Main Street is on the left, the house is on the other side of the road, right near where the spring is. And then the trading post is, um, you can go there now. It's um, it's known as Smith Castle um, and it's on the, the west-hand side of, of the bay. Um, I encourage you to go and visit both of those sites. Uh, one of the things that Niff and I love to do is, is experiential learning and I think you can just figure out so much by visiting these places and and we've been privileged to see both both sites um in England and New England yeah good question excellent uh, in 1653 what income did Mary have to feed her family yeah that's such a good question um you know and I don't know the answer I would imagine that stuff that Roger had had left um I know what I will say to you is that when um, John Clark is in England for a much longer period um, on charter business, right? Like Roger comes back because he's, it seems to me that he's so desperate to see his family that he leaves Clark in charge of the charter business. And we know then that they basically rally to kind of support Clark and his family. So, I, I mean, I, I say this because I don't know, and maybe you have a better idea, McNiff, that I would imagine that she's surviving on the stuff that he's kind of made from his trading post. We know like uh, at some point in, in um, Roger uh, helps build a bridge in Providence and he keeps it in the family to go as a way to kind of make income um and she would have perhaps made yeah like that's a good question like thinking about the way she would have would have survived perhaps on on donations and trading trading goods maybe well, what do you I, think I, I, as you were as you were bringing up um what mentioned in uh thatcher's book good wives is each one of the families would have looked would have looked more like a corporation with the husband being the ceo the chief chief executive officer the wife being the chief operating officer and the children being labor. And with the husband absent, the woman would keep the household business going and there would be other things around. Um, you don't have a cash economy, so things are done in bartering and trade. Yeah, exactly. And thinking about the fact of like where the house lives and where the house lives, where the house sits and stuff like that, you know, um, like that being a, a huge hub for trade too, right? Like she would have been in a really good position to, to to kind of trade goods with with all kinds of people at crossroads of major highways okay next question what yes, was the name of had land i'm farm. sorry he had land and farming right yes. yeah i know i wonder that stand too like how much farming did the family actually do like that's why I, you know like you know my interest in in equine history you know so that that is, is something i'd like to think more about he had sons and brothers <laughs> It's not all him, right? Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. What was the name of the island that Mary went to during King Philip's War? Uh, she goes down to a quidnick. So, um, you know, like where uh, Middletown is and Newport. So uh, just across the bridge from uh, Bristol. Okay. Um, next question is, what was the average life experience for men and women during, the, during this time? Uh, life expectancy of men and yeah. women during this time period? 
So that's such a good question. And again, it's something that Ranger McNiff and I have talked about, right? So one of the things that people say is like, oh, you had a really short life expectancy in the 17th century, because when you crunch the numbers, it looks that way. What I would say to you is if you made it through childhood, you had a reasonable chance of making it to a, a reasonable adult age, right? Like, so when you look at the statistics, it, it tends to, and you do like the mean age of death, it, it looks a lot lower than it was because those childhood deaths bring that figure down. But if you made it through, yeah, your childhood, you, you could make it to your like 60s, 70s. Like, I mean, Roger's 80 when he dies. So it would really depend on, on, on what's going on and where you are, right? Like if you were a well tended to white woman, you had a, a better chance of making it to old age than perhaps an indigenous slave or something like that, right? Like it, it, it or, or, or not, like it it, 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 it depends. I think that's what I'll say. I, I don't think, I think I, I agree. It's, it's not as short as people expect from the statistics that they hear. Yeah. Okay. Can any other information be gathered from any his, history left behind from Mary's chil children? Yeah, I mean, maybe, right? Like it could be a really good exercise in trying to trace some of the correspondence there. Um, I'd be really curious to go down that route. I mean, I'm trying to, so here's, here's where I'm at. So at the moment, I think this will just be a standalone journal article on Mary, but what I could see is that doing more research, hopefully with the, with the family association too, thinking about what does that mean? Like one of the things, again, McNiff and I have talked about the, the, the descendant that I'm most interested in is, is Providence Williams, right? Like that's, that's the, <laughs> the descendant that I'm most interested in. Um, and like, I'm not gonna say our secret theory, but like he's a trader, like he is a sloop, like he's regularly kind of operating in that like early modern trading world. So I'd be really curious to see if, if there are any correspondence from Providence in, in archives in the West Indies maybe. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd be curious to see. Road trip. <laughs> that, that's it. Retracing Providence, Caribbean edition. Okay. Were Richard and Mary Barnard ancestors of Henry Barnard, the 19th century education reformer? I have no idea. Um, I don't know. I don't want to guess. Um, I don't know. Um, maybe someone from the family association knows, but um, I don't know is the answer. I'd, I'd love to find out. Okay. Uh, next one. Were any of Roger and Mary's descendants prominent in Rhode Island history? Who might they be? Who might they be? Yeah, I think you're better uh, equipped to answer that than me, McNair. Well, um, in most, most recent history, we've had a governor, a senator, and uh, many businessmen. Senator, senator and Governor John Chafee, and of course his son Lincoln Chafee, are both direct descendants of Roger Williams. And um, there's I think I'm not sure of the number now, but there's uh, millions and millions of descendants of Roger and Mary Williams alive today. We're talking 12, 13 generations out. Um, there's a lot of them out there. I'm sure there's there's many more others that were pro that are prominent in the in world history at this point. Okay, as a direct descendant of William Brewster, my 12th great grandfather. I now I now understand why I am so interested in the religion of this time period beyond uh, beyond, beyond the Puritans. It's quite fascinating. How did Mary feel about the Joshua Verin case? Oh Ooh. yeah, so I know, right? So I think when I write this article, I'm trying to think about how I open this article, and I'm torn between like luring you into that love story like I did when like Roger's writing passionately about in love and it's not Mary or starting with imagining how Mary felt with the Joshua and Jane Burin case so for those who aren't familiar with it it's a really sad story it's about Roger and Mary's um, next door neighbors when they live in Providence Joshua and Jane Burin and Joshua basically um is, is very physically violent to his wife, Jane, um, because she um, she wants to hear the, the religious word with Roger, right? She, she wants to go and, and hear what Roger has to say and, and her husband, Joshua, does not want that to happen. Uh, and it's so bad, basically, it comes to Roger's attention and other people in the town. And, um, you know, it, it, it brings this huge court case forward. And it, it it's really interesting in the fact that they they're putting to test Roger's ideas of like, what does it mean to have religious freedom, right? Because in theory, you can believe what you want. So can Jane believe what she wants? 
or is she, you know, in 17th century norms subjected to her husband? So we see that kind of secular religious class here. Um, and it's, yeah, I, I really do wonder what Mary thought about this, um, especially given her upbringing in a, in a deeply religious household, you know, thinking about her experiences with her father. You know, we know from scattered references that she is a bit of a caretaker, right? Like we see a request in like, remedies and things like that so I would I imagine she would have been horrified by it I, I I would I would go out on a limb and say she would be absolutely horrified by it um yeah okay next question is was Mary literate oh you you and I were just talking about this so yeah right I mean it's a reasonable assumption to make that she would have been right um thinking about again her background in England the fact that her dad is um a prominent minister uh, who writes multiple pamphlets on like why religion is important, like why the youth should be instructed. We know that um, Puritans generally, um, you know, really do push literacy as a way to be able to understand the Bible. Um, and, you know, we have that scrap of paper that I wasn't able to show you this evening that we believe are, you know, five words from Mary. So, you know, I would, I would, I think it's fair to say that she, she, she is, she's reasonably literate. You can hear my hesitancy to go too far, but I think it's a, I think it's a reasonable assumption to make. Yeah. How do you think her life as a 17th century woman would have been different had she stayed in England rather than coming to New England? Oh my gosh, yeah, I know. Uh, I think all that training that she had um, in the Masham household would have been way more useful um, than like living in Providence in a war zone, right? Like that, you know, managing the household when her husband's gone so much. I think, you know, if Roger had had stayed in his position in Essex, perhaps he would have, you know, got promoted. She would have lived a, a quieter life. But I just, I just don't know, to be honest. I think. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think I think it would have been an easier life in 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 many ways. No, Stan's shaking his head. Stan, tell me why you're shaking your head. You think it would have been easier? Oh, you're muted. Oh, Stan, there you go. Why why do you think it would? I think it would have been easier, right? She would have. He, he 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 fled because he was going to go to jail. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, but if he hadn't, right? Like, imagine if he'd have just sucked it up and stayed quiet. But he wouldn't have done, right? He would have never kept. No, quiet. he wouldn't. Have. But he um, would have gone. To jail. Uh, yeah. He, he would never got him. another position. Yeah. Because you know the yeah. worst was. Yeah. But I do wonder if she ever thinks like with her dad and Roger, like why can't you just, just stop it? You know. But she she's deeply religious herself, right? So, you know, yeah. I, I wonder. You look at everybody in that period of time; they're they're yeah. deeply religious. I mean, we we have a tr we have trouble in our time uh, appreciating how much religion meant to everybody. I mean, and in the in the 1640s, you have all that huge explosion of, of radicalism in religion. End up with Quakers and yeah. Levellers, and you know, on and on and on. So it's uh, it's tough. Yeah. They even got to Providence, you know. After all, some of his church people or people he was in his church with became Quakers and denounced him then. Yeah, it's hard, right? Like, you know, one of the my favorite letters are the um, Anne Sadler letters. Anne Sadler is um, the daughter of Sir Edward Cook, who is um, Roger's mentor when he's a teenage boy. And when he goes back to England, he writes to Anne Sadler and he sends her like uh, copies of his books. And she's yeah. like, if you ever come back again, I want you dead, you know, yeah. and she, you. she hates him. And so, you know, like, how, think about that right like having your childhood friends kind of turn away from you what again what was that like for Mary and and what a strong woman Anne Sadler is basically you know calling Roger out well I think that you might kind of remember that Roger went past uh Cook's house on his way to to, to the to the coast he didn't dare stop and tell him I know because he would get arrested and you know that must have been really heart-wrenching for him I imagine like he, he, he truly believes what he's doing is right, but it means making this break with this really influential person who shapes such a, so much of his early life. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> Next question is, Roger Williams interacted with Native Americans. Did Mary also interact with them? Yeah, this is one of the things we're trying to flesh out. I mean, definitely, right? We know from Roger's correspondence that, um, 
it like seems like every indigenous leader in the area is at his house at one point right and so mary definitely does um we know that um after the Pequot War, um, and again, there's research going on about this right now. It's, it's not my research, so this is not from me, but we know there's research going on into the status of um, the, the young boy who lives with, with Williams as a servant. We know that uh, Roger uh, does claim one of the captives in 1637. We know that he has a young man, Will, who, he, he, who does live with him. Um, and so Mary would have, would have known Will I mean, really well, right? Like he was living in the house. Um, and and yeah, Roger writes at length how indigenous leaders are always at his house, right? They're always wanting him to write letters for him. So so that makes me think that, you know, Mary would have too. And, and when Roger's away on charter business, indigenous leaders in the area would have been like been waiting with bated breath to figure out was, what was going on. So I can imagine that they would still kind of come by to Mary and say like, hey, have you heard from him? What's going on? Um, so yeah, I think definitely is the answer. Excellent. Um, next question is: I wonder what she thought about Anne Hutchinson. I know. Yeah, I would love. I would love Mary's reflections on on Anne Hutchinson. So one of the it's, it's funny that you mention Anne Hutchinson. Um, there's um, an, a really interesting pedagogy called Reacting to the Past, which came out of, of Barnard College, where basically students live in a particular historical moment and and kind of live through through experiences and what I just started running today with my students is the trial of Anne Hutchinson so like Anne Hutchinson is on my mind more than the normal and I really do wonder what she thought about that because it was really soon right like think about this Mary herself has only just got to Providence you know like right the year before Hutchinson trial kicks off and I wonder like if, if her and Roger had lengthy debates about what would happen how did she feel when you know Hutchinson eventually settles down on Aquidneck Island um, and yeah I, I think she would have um, I imagine she would have had some empathy for, for, for Hutchinson bearing in mind what's happened to to her own family uh, but I have no evidence to support that I'm just I'm just imagining what it would have been like to see, see another woman struggle. In part answer to uh, a previous question, somebody has put in the comments that uh, as far as famous descendants of Roger Williams is Nelson Rockefeller, Gail Borden, Charles Eugene, Eugene Teft, Michelle Phillips, Julia Ward Howe, Sarah Palin, Bill Gore, Governor Cranston, Hubie Bain, and many more. So, Love it. Yeah. Roger Williams University also houses the archives of the Roger Williams Family Association. So, you know, once COVID settles, if anyone wants to come and check out the archival collection, please do. Okay. Now, next question. When visiting the Roger Williams National Memorial, it was discovered that a woman owned a plot of land in the original first land portions. I wonder how this was viewed back in the day that a woman owned her own plot of land. Do you know more about this than me, Mick? Like, can I pass this question to you? No, 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 no. I mean, take it, take it from your point of view. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I, which woman are we talking about? It's like, probably Alice they, Daniels that they're talking about. Yeah, I mean, Widow Reeves. Widow Reeves. Reeves, Alice Daniels, uh, Jane Sears. Um, there were several of them. Yeah, I feel like you, both Stan and McNiff know more more about this than, than I do. So I don't want to say things that I, I don't know to be firm and true so it, I'm not sure I mean I imagine like women owning I'm not going to make random assertions here no I mean I think I, I personally think that it's like any frontier place where you don't have a lot of the social structures of an established society um everybody that's there is important and Alice Daniels had gone through an awful lot leaving her husband in England coming down here uh, spending time in Salem coming down here and eventually married the surgeon John Green and moved down to uh, the settlement in uh, what was then Shawmut. And I believe she was one of the people that died when the Massachusetts forces came down to attack uh, good old Sam Gorton down there. But um, we're talking about people that are on the fringes of polite society. And a lot of the social roles are gonna be blended because everybody has to put in stuff. Think about it much more like frontier Western America um, where it's up to everybody there to do the job. The first place in America to get the right to vote for women was Montana. It wasn't New York City. 
Well, yeah, that's an interesting thing to think about. And, you know, think about how different that is in, in many ways to the kind of courtly experience Mary would, would have had growing up um, where, where, where gender roles in the society she moved in in England were, were very rigid. Okay, entirely speculative. But does Mary see aspects of her father in Roger? I mean, I don't know, right? Like, that's what I was, was trying to lead you to. Um, I mean, think about it, right? Like, uh, a minister, right? So we see that that parallel. Someone who has definitely got a toe in the door of Puritanism, who, who flirts with separatism, right? Both Roger and her dad do that. Her dad turns his back on separatism, you know, like, Think about what Roger does too, right? Like, you know, where, where does he go? Um, someone who clearly isn't afraid to speak his mind. Um, someone who um, is really well known, right? Like her dad is, is like an, you know, an eminent theologian and publishes extensively. So does her husband. So, I mean, I wonder if she, she did. I think that the family connection that I was trying to tease out between the Barnard family and the Whaley's and all of that, and, and, and her dad's connection to um, the folks who eventually uh, settle at Plymouth. I think it's really, really interesting. I think I, I really would love to think more about what was it like for Mary to arrive in Plymouth, kind of knowing everyone, right? They knew she was a kid and to have had her dad kind of say, oh, separatism's great. And then go, actually, no, it's not. Like that, that, that really like puzzles me. Like that, that would have been, yeah, that would have been an interesting moment. Next question. Um, did Roger actually row from Smith's Castle to Providence, which I've heard often? I mean, Roger is like, one of the things that, strikes me about Roger is that he must have been physically fit right like it seems like he is I don't know maybe I've just read it like this but he's he's always rowing right like it's it, you have a cho you have a choice you're either going to follow on foot on the Indian trails or you're going to hug the the shore in in a dugout and he he does right like does he does he cut he I mean he he must have gone there. We know he rows round the bend in in the in the in the river when he comes round. He must have made that journey, I imagine, multiple times in a in a machine, McNiff, right? Like, well, not just a machine. I mean, he he probably had a small shallop or something like that to take trade goods down as well. So not just rowing, but also sailing. Yeah, sailing down the bay, starting a tradition that goes on to this day. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, I've heard that people are preparing for like the anniversary of the row, right? Like I've heard that this is coming up in the next, I don't know, year or two or whatnot. Well, 2022 uh, is going to be the 350th anniversary of Roger's trip down to uh, Newport to debate the Quakers. And the so, um, yeah, hopefully something will come of it. I read it in the in like I read it a while ago that like people are training now ready to like recreate the row to to have a debate with the Quakers. I mean, I'm all for that. There, there was somebody that did it back in 1985, I think, that uh, went down the west side of the bay and then crossed over, which is wow. probably not the way Roger did it. Roger did it probably. Roger probably went down the east side of the bay. We only have short, big crossings because one of the things that comes out about Roger is he didn't know how to swim. Right. So where's the source then, McNiff, that he didn't know how to swim? Um, there's one letter that he writes where the Indians are taking him in one of the machines and they start rocking the boat. And he's, he's, he's afraid that his books are going to get wet and that he might fall in and drown. Love it. Excellent. I mean, you heard it here first. Roger Williams could not swim. Um, okay. Now, let's see. What was the charter business that Roger Williams and Mary were involved with? So yeah, trying to get a charter for Rhode Island. So when um, they settle Providence, they, uh, well, I say they, uh, Roger 
buys the land from Canonicus and the, the antinomian, this term buy is, is problematic, right? Like what did that trans transaction look like? You know, he later talks about how it was love that bought providence, but really, you know, we know that Canonicus and the antinomy hold all the power, I think, in that moment, right? They're really shrewd in their decision to let Roger settle there in, in what is um, a really important trading spot. And again, McNiff and I have talked about this, thinking about the kind of reciprocal nature of indigenous culture right like if if you give something away that gives you power and prestige so by you know allowing Roger to settle there like that showed their power and their prestige and, and Roger would have would be in tribute to them so um what was the question again about, about the, the charter, charter business oh, about the charter. so so they get the land um from 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 Canonicus to the Antinomy and then what that means is like folks down in Plymouth and in, in Massachusetts Bay are like I don't see that as necessarily the most legitimate way, right? Like indigenous land rights is one of the issues. Um, and so he then kind of retroactively, uh, amongst with a bunch of other settlers in, in, um, in Rhode Island, tr then tries to get a charter. Um, they go back in the 1640s, right? And while Roger's there, he publishes some of his most eminent works, right? The Bloody Tenon and um, A Key into the Language. Um, you know, the key into the language is also a, is also a political move to try to help the government in England to get the charter for him. Um, it doesn't work, right, as um, England's in the midst of absolute mess in the mid 17th century, right? They're about to have a civil war, chop their king's head off, um, have Oliver Cromwell be Lord Protectorate. So like giving a charter to a small obscure colony across the pond is not necessarily like number one business where you've just chopped your king's head off. Uh, and so what we see then is it, it, it comes up again once um, once Charles II um, is restored, uh, when the monarchy is, is restored in, in 1660, um, and he then gets that charter um, three years later. So the charter business is, is basically keeping the colony of, of, of Rhode Island um, and protecting the boundaries and like protecting all of the things that he he wanted to have in this lively experiment. And you should definitely, once things are safer, go and see the charter. It's on display at the State House. It's the Charter Museum is absolutely fabulous. And if you're interested, I know that the State Department did a bunch of videos uh, in the past year while we've all been home uh, looking at symbolism on the charter. Like the first, like the top bit of the charter has got huge symbols and emblems and, and Lane Sparkman has done some great videos. So if you're interested in the charter, um, have a look online, the videos are super. Excellent. Could, could, could okay. I comment on the first charter? Oh uh, yeah. You put this in the context. Uh, Plymouth and Connecticut and Massachusetts did not recognize the validity of Rhode Island and they actually formed a military alliance uh, and they left all the, the Narragansett Bay towns out, deliberately left them out. And that's what pr prompted Roger Williams to go back to England in the first place to go get some kind of a patent to try to protect his colony, his settlement against the uh, attempts by these neighboring colonies to dismember it. And so that's what he did. And then the second time was after Charles II came to the throne, he voided all the things done during his uh, in, during the interregnum, which meant that Roger Williams's patent was voided. And that's why uh, John Clark, who was over there, uh, proceeded to get a new charter, which mm -hmm. put Rhode Island first in the thing. If Roger Williams had done it, it would have been Providence Plantations in Rhode Island. <laughs> That's smart, yeah. And you know, one of the things I love about the charter is like how massive Charles II's head is, right? Like if you, I wish I had a, an image easy to, to show you, you can Google it, Rhode Island Charter. Like they like, they're like Charles II by the grace of God, King, and then it lists all the, the places. Like, you know, they're, they're playing a really smart, shrewd political game right here, I think when, oh, yeah. when they do that. I just noticed the time we're running a little bit long here, but yeah. this is absolutely fascinating. I've got two more questions and then we're gonna wrap things up here, I think. Uh, it's interesting about Will, I think that, that his name, the young indigenous boy who lived with Roger. What was Will's relationship to the family? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there's ongoing research on this. I, I just read, um, a paper that um, a scholar whose name I can't say is working on this, uh, who, who literally is looking at, at the relationship, like who was Will is the title of the piece. Um, and so we know then that 
he is described as a servant. What does that term mean, right? Like that, that is one of the kind of really difficult questions that we're asking. Like, is he enslaved? Is he allowed to leave after a certain amount of time? Um, what, what's he doing day to day? Like, is he free to marry? Is he free to travel? Um, we know that he is entrusted with, with responsibility. Like we know that he's given um, arms to go and go hunting at one point, presumably without Roger. Uh, we know that he helps Roger with a couple of business transactions. Um, so yeah, what is the status? I mean, one of the things to think about is the, is, is conversion, right? Like Roger, you know, in the early days is, is like, he writes at one point, like I long for native souls, but then obviously he, he doesn't believe that it's his job to convert, right? Like he, he doesn't think it's, um, it's not that he doesn't want to, he doesn't think he's able, right? He doesn't think it's right for like um, a human to interpret the Bible. This is part of the reason why he gets so upset with John Elliot. Um, and so, I mean, one of the things that I, I wonder about Will is, is the conversations they had about religion, right? Like behind, behind closed doors. Um, so yeah, the status of Will, um, is 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 ongoing and and one of the things that's interesting is in in the 1637 when roger's picking out who he wants right like he writes that there's a young indian boy with with red about his neck and you know he asks john winthrop to kind of give the boy a name and so we're trying to figure out like is this will is this someone else like what's what's going on with that so yeah the status of will and other indigenous peoples in the household and work still going on okay and the last question for tonight, you said giving things away gave the giver power. Is this why Native Americans gave away land very cheap? That's a really problematic question. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's a really difficult question to answer, especially as a non-native talking about native issues. So, and land and land issues are particularly contentious with what's going on right now. Like I'm thinking about, the land up the street from where Roger Williams University is that's owned by Brown that's in the midst of a land dispute settlement. So I think that the idea of giving land away is, it's that's not what happens, right? Like we see, especially as we hit the 18th and 19th century and as, as westward expansion carries on, like that's not what's happening, right? Like we know about like settler colonialism, kind of all the terrible things that happens when, when um, European colonists settle and, and just take the land, right? Um, and, all, you know, we, we hear the stories about how Indigenous peoples um, don't necessarily know what they're signing for, how they are kind of got drunk, but like th that's not the case in all of them, right? Like there's been some really interesting work done, particularly on New England in the 17th century on, on charters and on land deeds as a primary source. And um, there's some really interesting examples of indigenous peoples who, who, who sign their mark, right? Like there's um, uh, the, the deed for Providence is signed by Canonicus and the Antinomy. We know there's a, a sachem in the area uh, who signs as Robin Hood. And so I think it varies from time to time and place to place. And I think it's hard to make a, a sweeping generalization about like indigenous peoples voluntarily giving land away. What we know is that when Canonicus and the Antinomi made that decision, like they knew Roger, right? Like there, there was a long standing relationship at that point. And they, they knew that they stood to gain with the trading connections that, that he brought to the area. Excellent. Ah, all right then, everybody. Thank you, Charlotte. That was absolutely brilliant. Absolutely and thank you beautiful. so much, um, thank you. John and Stan, for like pitching in. Like, it's always interesting to hear your perspectives. I always have so much to learn from you both. You know, you know, Stan, Charlotte, myself. We should probably get Julie in too. We could, we could have some sort of a public session where we all start answering questions about Roger from our own backgrounds. Yeah, I think that's so true. I think that's so true. Thank you so much for having me. It's been such a pleasure to talk Mary tonight. Excellent, excellent. Charlotte, thank you. Everyone, thank you for attending. Um, we'll see you all somewhere soon. We're gonna be having more talks like this. So uh, keep, your eye on, uh, keep your eye on the postings on Facebook. That's the easiest way to find about, out about these things. Talk to other people about it and uh, we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having